All right, so this is Dr. John Stevens. Dr. Stevens is pulmonary, also at Riley. Um, he has been with us a bunch of years. Do you remember how many? Um, I started as faculty in 86, but I started as a medical student in 79. So. Uh, we've, only been doing, we've only been doing this since 90, so uh, you've been around most of that time. <laughs> so anyway, Dr. Stevens has some personal experience also with PMD. He cared for my son, Adam, so um, he does have experience. He's kind of seen some of your kids in passing. Um, and we'll be able to answer some of your general questions as he goes along. So, all right. Good. Thanks, Patty. So, yes, yeah, so I'm on the pulmonary docs at Riley, and uh, Patty asked me every year to come out and talk about the pulmonary complications of the lung, lung issues of PMD. Um, and so, we'll kind of run through a few things. Please feel free to stop me and just ask questions as we go, um, or you can ask either, at the end, whatever. Um, but we'll kind of run through some things and. I think you, well, you guys hail from, how, how many states they come from this year? 14 Oh my goodness, so from all over the place this year. All right, so what do we know about PMD, uh, the pulmonary complications? I mean, the issue is, and this is true of any illness that has a, a progressive or, you know, CNS degeneration, or really even kids that just have, say, a static problem, but it's not progressive, if they have severe underlying neurologic issues, they all kind of end up falling into the same issues from a pulmonary standpoint. And so, Dr. Walsh, especially, but from a pulmonary standpoint, you know, we see kids with similar neurologic problems every day. It's a kind of routine kind of thing we see at, uh, at a tertiary children's hospital. Um, but again, with PMD, the issue is as, as you get further CNS degeneration, you run into things like oral, uh, oral motor control that is issues you know, swallowing, um, decreased laryngeal control, that'd be problems with the airway itself, done on the voice box, the vocal cord area. Um, poor control of your thoracic muscles, so your cage wall muscles don't work like they should. Uh, and then decreased control of your muscles of breathing. And so we'll kind of go through those four different areas, kind of highlight the, the problems you would run into and, and what kind of things we can do to um, mitigate some of the issues that we see. So poor oral motor control. The, the biggest thing to worry about there, if, you, if you're having trouble with swallowing, okay, the last thing the pulmonologist wants to see is the stuff ends up in the lungs. So aspiration. I mean, the lungs are, are someplace that we're, we're, we used to think they were completely sterile, but they're not completely sterile. But in fact, there's normal good organisms down there. But there certainly isn't we don't like food particles getting down there. We don't like liquids of any sort getting down there. And that's the problem that you have in kiddos that can't coordinate the, uh, when, they, when they swallow. Um, short term, that can be, you can have major, single major episodes of aspiration. That is, say they, they have a big mouthful of something and boom, it goes into their airway. That can lead to a pneumonia right at the time. It can lead to uh, actually an obstructed airway at the time. Um, then after you get, re if this happens on a recurrent basis, you worry about gradually destroying the lungs. And, and the term for that would be bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is really a dilatation, an enlargement, and a damaging of the airways and cells because of chronic or repeated infections. And the issue you get in with that is that if you have damage to the airways themselves, then you, you, you disrupt the normal clearance mechanism for the lungs. You know, whether you know it or not, all day long we're producing secretions in our lungs. And there's something called the mucociliary train, so there's little hairs that beat, and they move the mucus up, up out of the lungs and we swallow it. And that's how we keep our lungs clear. But when you develop bronchiectasis, you start damaging the, the normal architecture of the lungs. That, that, that mucociliary train is disrupted. So you no longer have the ability to clear your lungs, clean your lungs like you, like you all do every day, all day long. So things have a tendency to hang around more, and the more they hang around, uh, <clears throat> you end up with a chronic infection. The chronic infection leads to more bronchiectasis, and it's kind of a vicious cycle that kind of gets out of control over time. So we try to intervene and step in with therapies that can help us with the clearance of things when we start to see that issue. How do we diagnose this? Um, typically, we, we're gonna, gonna look at this early on and try to get a good history you know, the kid's able to eat. Uh, Dr. Walsh was talking about how long does it take them to eat. You know, it's, it's always, it's, it's not a good sign if the child, rather than taking, say, 10 to 15 minutes to take a bottle, is taking 
30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour to take a bottle. Um, and so we're going to take them for anyone they're clearly getting choked or after they take a feeding and all of a sudden the parents say, gee, they're really rattling their chest afterwards and they cough forever afterwards. Um, <laughs> having said that, uh, a lot of kids don't get choked when they, when they, um, when they're, they're having problems with swallowing. They'll be what we call silent aspirators. How do we figure it out? We do a video feeding study. So typically that's done, and, and many hospitals are able to do this. I actually go around the state of Indiana. We take our services out to the different areas of the state. Most of the hospitals I go to actually um, will have at least a speech therapist that can work with radiologists and do these video feeding studies. And generally they do a pretty good job. I really haven't seen any place do it. Not, not a very good job. A lot of times they say, gee, you have to go up to Riley to get stuff done. But in fact, the video feeding studies, it seems like um, there's expertise, at least in, the, in, in Indiana, throughout various other hospitals. I would assume that's probably the case throughout the country. Um, maybe not the really small hospital, but any hospital of any size probably has a speech therapist. It's probably more of an issue in, in adults with strokes and stuff, so that, but there's, that probably affords them the speech therapist that, that's going to be able to do feeding studies. Um, so you want to get a feeding study done, and with that, a lot of times what they end up doing is right then and there they'll say, gee, you know, it's repeated penetrations. By penetrations, we mean things are going down into the area of the vocal cords, but not going below it, okay? And think about it, when you or I just even accidentally, you know, get some saliva, some spit down in our, in our cords, we're reacting to it right away. A lot of times these kids don't react to it. It goes down there or they just let it sit there. Just, they, you hear them and it, it makes you want to cough. Okay, <clears throat> it's like I'm trying to clear my throat the whole time in the room with the kiddo. And uh, they just develop an insensitivity to the secretion being there. And that's where you end up seeing the silent aspirations. The kids are aspirating, they don't even act it, they're not coughing. They're not trying to clear the stuff, they just aspirate it. And that's probably the worst case scenario because you can't tell when they're aspirating or not. That's where you end up, you have to do the video feeding study. So when they do the video feeding study, the first thing they do if they see, the, typically what they do is, at least at Riley and the hospitals I go to, they'll start with thin liquids. Especially if it's an infant taking a bottle, they'll start with thin liquids. And if they see there's repeated penetrations or clear aspiration, then the first thing they're going to do is thicken the feedings. The standard thickening is one tablespoon. We used to use rice cereal, but recently something came out about arsenic and rice cereal, so we don't have rice cereal anymore. Um, I don't know, Larry, did you, did you know about that? Rice, rice cereal is full of arsenic? I don't know. The residents told me you can't use it anymore, doctor. It's two months ago. You have to use older ones. Okay. I've only been a doctor for 40 years. <laughs> I don't know if any babies have died of arsenic for you. Uh, anyway, so we use oatmeal. The standard thickening is one tablespoon for every two ounces. And uh, but what the speech therapist will do is they'll they'll try different degrees of thickening. What that does in my mind is just gives the kiddos a little bit more time to coordinate where where the formula is going, where the liquids are going, so they can kind of keep it out of the airway. Um, a lot of times it's so thick, for, for the infants, you end up having to cross cut the nipple a little, a little bit because they can't actually get it out of the nipple. So they'll have to work with that. Other times if the speech samples go, well, they just need a slow flow nipple. They can use normal thin liquid, but they need a, a slow flow nipple. Just again, the whole thought is slowing things down a little bit so you're not, you're not um, allowing them to ask for that. A little bit more time to coordinate where it's supposed to go. <clears throat> so back up in our diagnosis, the other thing I, I put up there is up with and, and Dr. Croft is going to come talk about reflux. You know, in my mind, you know, it's, it's, it may almost be worse if kids are, if you have a swelling problem, you know, you can, you can have a problem with it just going in, but if it clearly they're throwing up, then that's a major, major risk. And now you've added some stomach acid to it, okay, and you absolutely don't want them aspirating that. Um, Dr. Crawford will talk about that. I mean, one more thing to go back to diagnosis. A lot of times, what you'll get in some of the smaller hospitals is a docs will order just a plain upper GI or an esophagram. And I'll admit, while they look at swallowing a little bit, typically they'll do one or two swallows. I'm glad the swallow's fine, just move on. A lot of times, that is not an adequate study at all to look at swallowing. One of the big issues is that a lot of times kids don't start to aspirate or don't, don't demonstrate their dysfunction with swallowing until they've been eating for a while, we call it fatigue aspiration or fatigue dysfunction. So they have to eat a little bit, and then as they kind of get tired, then all, because they've worked really hard to keep where things are supposed to be going, so then all of a sudden they'll show problems. So a lot of times, 
that's what they'll do. They'll actually do the study, let them eat a little while, come back and do the study again to show their fatigue. So if you can do it, it's just an upper GI and software program, they're gonna have to take one of three swallows and radiologists say, oh, you pass, move on to the next part. So just be aware of that a little bit. So what happens if the thickened feedings don't work? And our, our speech therapists are very good at Riley. They're very good at saying, this kid cannot eat by mouth. Not safe to eat by mouth in any way, shape, or form. And, and they'll, they'll tell us it very quickly. It isn't just kids with PMD, but we have lots of different children. I swear there's been an epidemic in, in, in Indiana of just otherwise normal infants that have swallowing problems in the last 10 years. I have a lot of kids just come to me for noisy breathing or chest congestion, <laughs> like a video, video feeding study, some, just a lot of other like normal kids have issues. And, and uh, if it's not real obvious, and I send them to people like Dr. Walsh and say, you tell me why you can't swallow them, because everything else works fine. Um, so anyway, so if, we, if the thickened feedings don't work, then we have to talk about an alternate means of hydration and caloric intake. And that's typically going to be a, a tube of some sort. And kiddos, I don't, don't, we don't have, a, we don't expect them to, to get worse from a neurologic standpoint. We may say, okay, let's try a short-term nasal gastric tube. So a tube that goes into the nose, down to the stomach, thinking that maybe we'll just repeat the study in you know, a couple months and see if it's better and then get the tube out. With PMD, if you get to the point where you're having to talk tube feedings, it, it may be quite a different situation. It may be a much longer course. And it's much more comfortable for the kids to actually get a G tube. At least talk, talk about G tube buttons. Um, I'm sure, the initial surgery is, is, is somewhat uncomfortable. The kids seem to like surgery a whole lot better than adults do. Um, but, <clears throat> but I think in a kid with PMD, if they had a severe swallowing problem and you want to try and protect their lungs, I would talk, you know, a G tube um, early on. To, 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 so again, alternate means get this noxious stimuli out of the nose. And it's, it, it can't be pleasant. And the kids are, you know, if they can grab it and pull it out and put it down all the time, that gets to be, the parents don't like it, the kids don't like it. But now, so if you're, if you, if in fact you, you prevent as much aspiration as you can, um, the issue's still gonna be, let's say when you get a cold, what happens when they get a cold? Some of the kids, the kids runny nose of all this clear, but copious amounts of fairly thin liquid, well, typically we swallow them. You know, a lot of it's, you see these kids a lot, it's coming out the nose, but a lot of it, most of it's actually going down the throat. And so, if it's going down the throat, and the kid though has significant swallowing problem, probably a fair amount's actually going down into the lungs. <clears throat> so even if you're doing the best job you can, say the kids are just too fed, or you're thickening the feedings, when they get a cold, all bets are off, a lot of it's gonna end up in the lungs. So we have to do something to help clear the lungs out, and that's where we're gonna talk about chest physiotherapy, and we'll go over some different modalities of chest physiotherapy. Basically, I use that as an all-encompassing term to talk about different modalities that will, that will help you, um, or help the kids clear secretions from their lungs. Again, if you don't have these issues, um, you're not aspirating so much, you have a normal mucociliary train, you're clearing secretions all by yourself. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you're, you're gonna have is an effective cough. Children with any type of significant underlying neurologic problem most likely do not have an effective cough. Cough is actually the main way that we clear secretions. Um, so if you don't have an effective cough, um, you don't realize you're aspirating and get in trouble. Reflux medications. Again, Dr. Crawford will talk about that and you can bug him to death about reflux. The diagnosis of reflux, the treatment of reflux. Again, from my standpoint, I want him to fix the problem so it's not, you know, insulting the lungs. Um, and he's very good about that. I'll do a few things, but if it doesn't work pretty quickly, then I'm going to send him to see Dr. Crawford. Um, yeah, actually, fund of glycation, he'll talk about that too, because if you, if you absolutely try medications that doesn't work and you want to keep the lungs clean, then and there's something called, uh, we call it a nissen fund of glycation. There's actually many different techniques out there now, but basically you're absolutely preventing things from going from the stomach up. You can get into the stomach, but you can't get it back up. Uh, having said that, you can ask him too. He'll talk about it. Typically, the, while those surgeries are quite effective, they're not that long-lasting. Um, the, the, the fund applications will start to break down. Oral suctioning. Um, again, when you got kiddos that can't handle their normal pores, normal, normal secretions in their mouth, one thing we oftentimes send, send the patients or the parents home with are just ways to suction that. 
you know, as infants we may use just a bulb syringe, but very quickly we're going to transition to an actual machine, a suction machine, that then you can suction, suction the mouth out. Again, especially when they're sick, you know, when they have all these extra secretions from even a simple viral infection that may overwhelm them pretty quickly, you know, that's when you're going to employ something like that. Um, you just have to be a bit careful when you use them. You know, if you're deep suction, you don't want to traumatize the voice box itself. And I've seen parents get very, very vigorous, and all of a sudden they get lots of blood and stuff like that. That's probably not a good thing. But on the other hand, most of the people learn how to do it correctly. Um, and we'll spend time teaching them that, especially when the kids get hospitalized. And then medications. The other thing we can do, we can give medications, and I'll go over some medications we can give. The whole issue with any of the medications that decrease secretions, they, oft, they oftentimes will thicken the secretions too. And so it becomes a balance. You don't want the secretions so thick that you can't get them out, okay? But you want to decrease the production. So if they're not producing many, then you have a better chance of, of keeping their airways clear and their lungs clear, so. So medications to decrease oral secretions. Um, Robinol is probably one of the one of the main ones you use, probably that, the scopolamine patch. Um, scopolamine patch is, is like, you know, the, the traveler sickness or seasickness patch you put on behind your ear. I actually had one for something. I've had a bunch of surgeries recently. I put one on for nausea or something, but it dried me out so much. And that's it. It has a side effect of drying you out, and that's why we use it. Okay? Um, so, so both Robinol and the scopolamine patch both dry things, that they decrease secretion production, but they, they significantly dry it out. And so a lot of times when you start a patient on that, you, you know, you're in frequent communication with the parents trying to figure out is this too much or not, you know. Took it out with a scopolamine patch, over the years it's gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with the pharmacist. Can you give less than one whole patch? At one point the pharmacist says, oh, no, you, you, you show, we, we used to go when it first came out, we'd always, you know, use that. If, you didn't, if the whole patch is too much, you cut it in half or give it a quarter of it or something like that. Then the pharmacist came along and said, you know, the drug is not evenly distributed throughout the patch. So when you cut it in half, you don't know for sure you're giving 50%. So for several years, we said, okay, we can't do that. And then they said, well, maybe you can do that. And so what we're doing now is that we don't cut the patches because cutting the patches may actually release more drug right on the edge where you cut it. But they'll take and fold up part of the patch and put something under it, you know, say half of it. So that the patient's really only giving half the patch, and the half patch is there, but it's just not cut. So that's kind of the preferred method these days, that we use a partial patch. Um, but the whole thing is just trying to work with the parents and, and, and the kids and sort out what is the appropriate amount. Again, you don't want them too thick because then you can't even suction them out, okay? And it can be obstructing to their airway because they can't clear secretions at all. They have ineffective cough, and now they've got thick, thick secretions, and so they can't mobilize them. So that's not good either. The allergy, the allergy is something that, where's Patty? She done? Oh. When she was, when I was take, helping take care of Adam, we used to use Dalogy a lot because it had scopolamine in it. It was wonderful. Um, it was made by a local Indiana firm here. And we just we loved Dalogy. Um, then they took the, then they took the scopolamine out, and now it's just like any other decongestion over the counter. So, you know, you can try those. They may or may not be helpful. Okay. Atrovent. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, oftentimes used for asthma, okay, it, it isn't, uh, it's like the atropine below it, they're, they're both drying agents, they don't use those very much anymore, but occasionally we can use those. Again, typically the focus is going to be on the robinol and scopolamine patch. Nasal steroids, I put them up there because you know, these kids will get allergies like anybody else, okay, and especially sort of living in, here in Indiana, I don't know where you guys are from, but Indiana is just a hotbed for hay fever and allergies. Uh, especially if you get on the southwest corner down around Evansville, which I have a clinic down there. Um, so if they get allergies and they're producing all these, a lot of secretions there, then maybe nasal steroids would be appropriate. Okay? Because we're just trying to decrease the inflammation of the nose, you don't produce any secretions, thereby they're not aspirated many secretions. So that works well too. And actually, back to that, we said you can be used for nebulizer, but if you have non-allergic rhinitis, so non-allergic, non-specific inflammation of the nose is producing lots of secretions, then you may want to just try the atorrent and the nasal spray. Again, what we're trying to do is just decrease secretion production. Um, 
and, uh, and and do that in many different ways. But that, that's where you kind of it's the art of medicine. You look at the individual patient. You try this. You try that. You try this dose. You try that dose. Um, a lot of times, it takes a lot of a lot of assistance from the parents to help us figure out what is the appropriate regimen for this patient. Decreased laryngeal control. Now you're talking about the control in the upper airway. So what you have in the upper airway, you have this big flap called the epiglottis. Okay, the vocal cords are down here. There's two arytenoids here in the front. Go back. So, so what, what's supposed to happen when you breathe in is that airway should open up and the air should go in, okay? Early on, these structures are lined with cartilage, just like the baby's ears are lined with cartilage. The cartilage can be very soft, just like the ears are soft. It's something we call laryngomalacia. Um, but in kiddos that have underlying neurologic problems where they don't have the normal uh, nerve impulses going to the airway, they may not maintain normal tone of their airway just because of that. Um, and so that's the issue you get into with PMD. They're not putting the right impulses there to have the normal tone. And that gets to be a major issue. The kiddos can present just with strider. By strider, I mean, and what, what can happen is if your epiglottis and your retinoids are flopping in, there's a it's just like that. I don't know if any of your kids have had any problems with strider. Um, it can present very early on. A lot of kids that don't have underlying neurologic problems present to me with, with the strider, and it's just laryngomalacia. How do you make the diagnosis of that? Typically, you have to do a bronchoscopy, a flexible bronchoscopy. So we use a small, flexible scope. We go through the nose. This is done in an outpatient surgery area. Uh, numb up the nose. Might or might not do is a little bit of sedation. And we get on there and sit above the vocal cord area and the, the laryngeal area and see how things flop in when they breathe. It's a fairly easy diagnosis to make. Um, so, so that's the most common cause. Other, other reasons can be, again, if you don't have normal uh, input into that area, <clears throat> you may get collapsed, not just the, the voice box itself, but the whole, the whole back of the mouth and the deeper throat, the pharynx. So we can get pharyngomalacia. So again, it's not normal tone, the airway's collapsing actually right above where your vocal cords are. Um, anyway, the, the way it presents is with the strider. Um, this can then result in obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, kiddos with obstructive sleep apnea oftentimes present with snoring. They may have this, this inspiratory strider. Some kids will be more noticed when they're asleep, which in a lot of ways makes a lot of sense. If you, you know, we all, when we fall asleep, the tone in our body decreases. So if you start with a lower baseline tone and then you fall asleep, well, maybe your airway's gonna collapse even more on you. So you may see that the strider and or snoring, restless sleep, um, as your presentation for obstructive sleep apnea. How do you diagnose it? Again, we do the flexible bronchoscopy to make the diagnosis, where is the obstructing area? But what I use the bronchoscopy for is to define the anatomy, to tell me anatomically what is going on, where is the problem? And then I use the sleep study, and typically we're gonna prefer an overnight sleep study. Some places we'll do nap sleep studies. We'll typically only do nap sleep studies until kids are about three months of age. These kids are sleeping all the time the first couple months of life anyway. Uh, beyond that, a lot of times their naps during the day, they don't get into the stages of sleep where we expect to see the obstruction. And they're not going to get enough of what we call rap rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, where you're most likely to see problems with obstruction. <clears throat> so we want an overnight polysomnogram. This is, I know I talked back before about the video feeding studies, we can do that in many different hospitals. We've actually found with the overnight polysomnograms, especially if you're talking about infants, uh, kids probably under five years of age, there's only two or three places in Indiana that will probably do adequate studies in those younger kids. The problem is they don't have the technicians that know how to do them in kids. A lot of times they're adult labs. They don't have the, they don't have the patience to work with the kids. Um, and then the way the docs read it, they're all adult people and they don't know how to read pediatric studies. So I'd be much more selective <clears throat> if your physician said, gee, we really need to get a sleep study, you know, go into a pediatric sleep center to get that done. Um, you're just gonna get a much higher quality study. The, the studies aren't particularly uncomfortable, but they're not the most pleasant thing. And we have bed, we have a bed for one of the parents to sleep there the night. You know, you hook the kids up, you take all this stuff on their head and face and neck and then 
and they expect them to fall asleep. Somehow they do, but um, it, it can be. It's, it's just not the most pleasant night. And so if you're going to spend that 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 time and money and effort to do that, why don't you go someplace you know you're going to get a good study and you can make heads or tails. Again, I was telling you, I go down to Evansville, Indiana, Southwest is the big city. Two major hospitals that hate each other down there. They always have to duplicate everything, but they cannot do sleep studies in kids under the age of five. You know, I have to argue with their, who's ever their plan administrator for their insurance plan, going, oh, they can be done here. I said, no, they can't. So we stop them down there. So you have to be a bit selective. But based upon the bronchoscopy and the sleep study, then you can come up with a treatment plan. <clears throat> At times, nothing needs to be done. The kids are simply got a little noisy breathing. You know, they snore a little bit, rest of sleep, but there's nothing that really needs to be done. We look at something called, an, on the sleep study, called an apnea hypopnea index, okay? And what that is, at least in this respect, what we're looking for is the amount of obstruction over the amount of sleep time. And when we see a significant amount of that, that's going to help guide us. Do we need to do anything? If it's an older child, has big tonsils and adenoids, is the AHI high enough? Or is, it, is the child dropping his oxygen level enough? Or is his carbon dioxide level too high that we need to send him to the ear, nose, and throat doctors to get the tonsils and adenoids taken out? Um, in the younger infant, that's more of just a straight problem with laryngomalacia. Again, we're going to use the AHI, the oxygen saturations, carbon dioxide levels, to tell us <clears throat> is it time to do something uh, called a supraglottoplasty. The next point there. What a supraglottoplasty is, um, and this was actually devised by the ENT docs down in Cincinnati children probably 25 years ago. What they do is they actually go in with a laser, typically it's a laser, and trim part of the flopping airway. Okay, again, you got this big epiglottis here, whose job is to cover up the air, airway when you drink in these two little finger like structures here called the arachnoids. And depending on which one's flopping the most and causing the most obstruction, they may go and stand up with a lot of and just cut just a small portion of one side. It's called a partial supraglottoplasty. And that allows uh, there to not be quite so much flopping. As years ago, when they first started doing these, they actually did a complete supraglottoplasty. They would trim both sides of the epiglottis. They found, though, that about 10% of the kids they did that in, as that wound healed, the epiglottis would just scar right down over the airway. And the only thing you could do at that point was to put a trach in the child. Um, and getting those trachs out of those kids was very, very difficult. So now they start with a partial supraglottoplasty. They'll trim one side of the epiglottis and they trim one of the arachnoids up here. Okay? And that just allows you to not flop in and, and completely obstruct your airway. Um, so we kind of, as a pulmonologist, we do the studies. We call our ENT colleagues and say, gee, this kid's AHI is sky high. He clearly has bad laryngomalacia. Maybe time to consider this. And they're basically surgeons and do whatever you ask them to do because they like to do that's what they do, is they do surgery. So, we, not that we don't ask them to weigh in on the decision to do it or not, but, but you know what they want to do is they want to do surgery. So, um, so, what if you have, it isn't really a problem with laryngomalacia that's amenable to supraglottoplasty, but if they already had their tonsils and adenoids taken out, they still have significant obstruction. Then you might, may want to go some, with something where you apply some positive pressure to the airway. It could be CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, or BiPAP, which is two levels of CPAP. Um, and oftentimes in kids that have again, not just PMD, but have other severe forms of underlying neuro neurologic issues, you've done the tonsils and adenoids, they still have problems with, with this severe obstruction of sleep. And we'll talk about putting them on some of this. A lot of adults actually wear CPAP at night. So when I talk to them, they go, oh yeah, well, you know, my dad does that or something. That's what everybody knows what CPAP is. Typically, it's a little nasal mass that goes over the, the nose, and the pressure is applied. It's, it's a place on the kiddos when they go to sleep. Um, we have a really good group, a really good sleep group. Within the pulmonary division at Riley, we have one group, a group of the pulmonary docs that do nothing, pretty much nothing to sleep. And they actually have what's called a PAP clinic. Because it can be difficult, as you might imagine, especially when you're putting younger kids on these things. You strap this on their, on their nose, and you're blowing pressure in their face, and then you expect them to fall asleep. And it's like, oh, that's tough. But, so we have actually, a, um, the, the group includes a psychologist that, that works with the kids, works with the parents, um, and again, two of the sleep dogs, and, and they, they try all different types of masks, they try different techniques, they try different ways to get the kids 
kind of used to it, conditioned to it. And I have to admit, the machines are much better now than they used to be in the past. It used to be, the only video set is in one pressure, you put in a, you're immediately blowing this huge amount of pressure in the kid's face, and they did not like it, by and large. Uh, now they have stuff that's more of an auto pap kind of thing. <clears throat> It'll apply the amount of pressure needed. So if they're not really obstructing much, it's not going to blast their face with so much. So there's, there's many different techniques out there now. And we're very fortunate at Riley to have this really good sleep group, and they just, you know, basically you got a kid who has these kind of issues, and you're at the point where you need some type of support like that. They can take over and run with it and, and figure out how to get even the very young patients on that. Cardiac apnea monitors, we used to use this a lot more. That's where you actually put the kids up every night, something that measures their heart rate and their chest wall excursion. Um, I have to admit we've gotten away from this to a great degree. This would be the, in case a child would have has severe obstruction and would all of a sudden have an episode in the middle of the night where they would just literally stop breathing. Um, we'd be alerted to that. Unfortunately, studies show that this was, the cardiac apnea monitors came along with the um, description of sudden infant death syndrome. And clearly it's shown that cardiac apnea monitors had no impact on SIDS, none at all. Um, and so we've gotten away from that to, to a great extent. Quite honestly, what's going to happen if a child's airway, even if they have underlying neurological problems, if the child's airway becomes obstructed, you're actually going to try and breathe harder. And so the apnea portion of it is not going to go off. What's going to happen is in this, they've actually captured children who have died of SIDS on, on uh, event recording cardiac apnea monitors. <clears throat> What happens is their heart rate gradually goes down. Most likely what happens is their oxygen level drops, then their heart rate goes down, and then they finally stop breathing, and that would be the point where they would pass away. Um, so we, by and large, we, we don't use cardiac monitors a lot, but some parents are reassured by having something to monitor the child. And so if they're not sleeping at all, and they're spending every night, one parent is sitting up all night long with it, watching that patient, the baby sleep, then you know, I, it's reasonable to help them a little bit, do something. What's well, next? Decreased control of thoracic muscles. Yeah, so, question, sure, sure, sure. Every night. So what like that? How old? So, mom's question was she's a child that has trouble falling asleep at night every night. How old is he? 22 months. You know, I'd say you go to our sleep clinic. <laughs> that, that's a very challenging thing, and, and it's, it's a lot of what we call sleep hygiene. Have you ever heard the term sleep hygiene? So it, a lot of it is everything that you go through to prepare a child to go to, to, go to bed. And, and we have actually psychologists and sleep docs, and they'll spend a lot of time in saying, okay, what is the routine the kids go through in, in trying to go to bed? You know, where's the kid sleeping? What do they go through? And so they figure out ways to improve sleep hygiene. Okay, I am not one of the sleep docs. If I got a kid that, you know, is going through that kind of issue, I want you to go see the sleep docs. But, but um, it can be a real challenge. But having said that, at least our team is able to get that taken care of. So I don't know where you're from, but they may be, if you have pediatric sleep docs someplace, and it's really, really a challenge, I would ask for a referral to see those docs. Because they'll figure it out for you. All right, um, decreased control of thoracic muscles by thor thorax, okay, it's a chest cage. Okay, so I'm talking about the muscles that control the normal shape of the chest cage. And then, so that's very, very important, okay? Because um, what happens when you, <clears throat> when you don't have normal muscle input, normal neurologic input into the muscles that control the shape of your chest and your spine, it becomes very deformed. And the biggest deformity we see in a lot of these kids is the scoliosis, which is the curvature of the spine, okay? And as the spine curves, typically it doesn't just curve, but it curves and twists. And so it really, it, it then impinges upon the normal volume, the normal shape of the curve, it causes severe deformation of the chest. And that's gonna cause, especially on one side, typically one side, one lung's gonna be really de depressed. It, you know, it'll be, it'll be um, squished, essentially because there's no room for it to expand into. The lung itself is normal, but it's just now squished, okay? Um, and that leads to very low lung volumes. And it puts the, when the, when the chest is that way, it, it puts all the muscles at a mechanical disadvantage. The muscles of breathing, we're gonna talk about next. But it puts them at a distinct disadvantage. So now you've got a child that doesn't have normal tone, 
and has a very abnormal shape, spine and chest. So you've just compounded the whole issue of being able to move air in and out of your chest, being able to clear secretions from your chest, um, and, it, and it predisposes for pneumonia, recurrent pneumonia, the bronchiectasis as I talked about early on. If you, if you collapse down the lung, you produce what's called atelectasis. So it predisposes for those kind of issues. Treatments, um, you know, typically if it's very severe, we're gonna say you need to see our orthopedic surgeons. They have a lot of new options these days. Um, you know, braces, surgeries, things like that. Dr. Walsh talked about that briefly. Um, what they're gonna try and do is straighten out the spine. You know, if you can straighten it back out and straighten out the twisting in the chest, you will to some degree um, get back to normal lung volumes. Again, you're still working with kiddos that you can, you can talk about that. <coughs> well, I talked about all these things between the, the, the uh, poor tone, you know, the, the twisting of the spine, twisting of the, the chest cage. Um, it all leads to a very ineffective cough. So the question is, how can we, how can we help the kiddos with that? Because again, with ineffective cough, I guess, as I mentioned earlier on, that's the main way we clear secretions from our lungs. So even if you get a simple viral infection, and the virus is typically will extend down into the airway somewhat, then you produce all these extra secretions, you have to cough to clear them out. Well, these kiddos have lots of trouble with that, and that leads to uh, recurrent or persistent pneumonia. So again, long-term leads to the bronchiectasis, long-term it leads to respiratory failure. So, wait, I talked about earlier, you can do some form of chest physiotherapy, and again, what I mean by chest physiotherapy it's just employing any type of method that can help the kiddos clear secretions better. Okay? <clears throat> a lot of times we start out just with doing what's called percussion and posture drainage. So literally these little cups that you see here, okay, it's, it's very much like percussion is the uh, same as like if you got a, a bottle of Heinz ketchup, okay? Really thick, you know, good tasting ketchup and it doesn't come out of the bottle. So you turn it up over end and you boom, you hit it on the end. That's basically the same thing you're doing with percussion treatments. Okay? Just trying to move those secretions, trying to put that shock wave in there and move the secretions up and out of the airway. Well, you can do it just with a cupped hand, okay? Like that, and you really want it to have a, kind of that kind of sound. But a lot of times, infants, that isn't going to work. I mean, your hand's as big as his chest, you know, half their chest. So we use these little, little um, rubber cups, and so you can work on a tiny little area. And ideally, when you do percussion and posture drainage, you actually would put the patient in a position so that each segment of the lung is put in a position where you're going to optimize drainage. Okay? The one issue you run into, and that even I won't like it, but Dr. Crawford probably won't like it either, is you're <clears throat> predisposed to reflux. And you get the kids up like this, and you start hitting them on them, and then you're going to you know, knock stuff out of their stomach as well. So you have to watch out you're not causing more problems with reflux. But that's what we use. When the kids get a little bit older, you can actually use some vest type of therapy. What that is, it's, it's a, it truly is a vest that goes on, and it basically is this oscillating column of air that you can change the rate with which it's oscillating, and it kind of vibrates your chest all over and helps the kids move it like mobilize secretions. This first came out for use in kids with cystic fibrosis, which produce very thick, sticky secretions. Because they don't clear the secretions, they get recurrent pneumonias, they get the same type of bronchiectasis, this leads to respiratory failure. Um, and parents were having to do it. all the percussion, all the chest physiotherapy was done by manual percussion. And they, a lot of times, we have them do it two, three, even four times a day because they have very thick, sick secretion. So that's where someone then came out, actually, from one of the CF docs in, in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul area, <clears throat> came up with advanced treatments. Initially, when they came out and they brought this into our clinic, I'm what is it? Like they went to Sears and we went a bunch of spare parts and put them together and go, okay, yeah, we're going to charge you $15,000 for this. That was 25 years ago. Now they, it's, it's, the regular vest is owned by Hillrom and uh, they're actually pretty nice devices. There are some competitors out there in the market. Uh, initially, the indication was only cystic fibrosis, but now if you have kiddos that have any significant underlying neurologic problems and they're having problems with uh, <clears throat> poor airway secretions, you know, poor, poor clearance of airway secretions, um, most insurance companies will pretty readily pay for this. Um, have there been great studies done in kids with underlying neurological problems? I don't think there are great studies, but I think most insurance companies are convinced that if you use something like this on a regular basis, that it's probably going to prevent hospitalizations, and so that they're always looking at it. Is it going to save them money? 
And so, even though they're not cheap, I mean, they're like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to buy them outright. Um, the best people when they first come out with that price, but we'll give you a free vest as the kid grows. Oh, okay. Um, or they want to charge you five hundred bucks a month for the rest of, rest of your life, kind of thing. So, uh, but again, most insurance companies they probably have contracted with them and they'll get them for you. So something to consider is that it's just a, it's a more comfortable way of doing chest physiotherapy. So put one of these vests on, the kids can sit there and watch TV, play video games, something like that. And the parents are having to you know, sit there and pound uh, on their kiddos. And a lot of the kids in CF, the parents come in, they start developing arthritis in, the, in the, their elbows and shoulders and stuff, and I can't do this anymore. <clears throat> but uh, so there's some other things we can use. In the hospital, we use something called Easy Pap, and um, there's a new one that we use. Um, what these, a lot of these devices do is it, it's kind of the same thing. You're doing percussion from the inside out, okay? So, so rather than that, that vibrating column of air being on the outside, shaking, it's really shaking from the inside out. I've actually seen videos where they'll do, do some of these modalities and they're in the airway with a scope, rocket scope, and they turn the device on, you can see the screen just really bubble up out of the airways. Unfortunately, most of those are not available for home use right now, so we use them more in the hospital. The one thing you can take home is, is this cough assist device. What that does, um, it provides positive pressure. Typically, it's oftentimes used when the kiddos are getting like albuterol treatments if they have an asthma component to their lung problems. So it's during the aerosol administration, <clears throat> but it, it, it will, it will um, give them some breaths, and then at the end of a breath, it actually applies negative pressure. So it's like, almost like pulling the air out of them. And many of these kiddos will have that kind of thing at home also. Hypertonic saline. So that's like, um, you know, really high concentration of salt is all it is. How does that work? It actually draws water into the airway. Where did it come from? It's kind of an interesting story. Again, this is from the CF patients. But there was a group of CF patients from Australia that they like to go surfing. They know the same time they went out surfing, she all of a sudden they're mobilizing a bunch of excretions. And so they studied them and go, well, that's because they're inhaling that very high salt content mist that was in, in, you know, above the waves and stuff. And so, um, kind of interesting side light. But <clears throat> so now we, quite honestly, we use hypertonic saline in kiddos of all different diseases that have trouble mobilizing the excretions. The excretions get too thick and sticky. What can be the downside of this? Well, this comes in two concentrations, 3% and 7%. Um, 7% is what we use in our CF patients. It can cause bronchospasm. That is, if you have a problem with asthma, it can make your airways get twitchy because it's, it's a bit irritating to your airways. And typically, the patients will actually cough quite a bit in response to the hypertonic saline. Um, so we have to watch the kids closely. A lot of times, it's administered in conjunction with giving some albuterol to relax the muscles around the breathing tubes. So you got the breathing tubes open. They're not going to be so twitchy because you just gave the albuterol, and then you give the hypertonic saline. And the kids still will cough a lot and mobilize secretions. This also comes on 3%, and uh, sometimes the young infants will, will, or some kids just don't tolerate the higher concentration, they use it 3%. Uh, but it clearly has been advantageous in a number of different pulmonary problems where the kiddos have thick, sticky secretions and have trouble mobilizing, mobilizing those secretions. And then there's something called polozyme, which is DNAs. Again, this came from the CF literature. Um, we at Riley were actually involved in some of the very early studies of this. <clears throat> so what happens when you get chronic infection in your lungs, the white blood cells in the body go to the lungs and they try to combat the infection. And when they're combating the infection, they kind of do their job for a while and they, get, they die, okay? And as they die, they dump the contents of the cells into the lungs. And a lot of times, the majority of that stuff is, is actually the DNA from the chromosomes in, in the white blood cells. Well, that DNA makes the secretions very thick and sticky. So, so just the DNA itself makes the secretions very thick and sticky. And so they actually use DNAs, so it's an enzyme that breaks up DNA, and they first started this again in CF patients because they have major big time chronic infection. And they found that G would actually liquidize the, the sputum. And the classic one was they have two test tubes of sputum, and when they put DNAs in it, Pulmosine, when they did, they turned upside down. The one that had the pulmosine, it just drained right out. So it really does go a long way to, to liquefy it. Um, typically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the hypertonic saline first, because a lot of times that will do, it kind of does the same thing, but by an entirely different mechanism. You know, we're trying to liquefy the sputum so it can get out of the lungs. Uh, so we'll try that. 
I can, I can tell you the insurance companies are not real happy about paying for home time. Um, again, our CF patients are standard of care, and the other patients are, oh, you know, show me the studies and aren't any studies. Um, and it's probably going to cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year to use this once a day. So it's a very expensive therapy. Um, so that's why insurance companies drag their feet in that. Hypertonic saline, it's salt water. Okay? Yeah, it's more concentrated, but it's salt water. So um, it's much, much cheaper. And may do the same thing. Um, so some, something to consider trying to switch over. You know, try, try to do that first if you need to go that route. So what happens with, again, these kiddos that have an ineffective cough because of, import, uh, because of poor tone, poor neurologic input into the muscles, you know, they can get, they'll get they're going to get the URIs and all the other kids are going to get. How many URIs do kids get on average? Well, the average child is not in daycare. It's five to seven upper respiratory effect viral infections a year. Recent studies show that kids in daycare can get up to 18 a year. That means every two to three weeks they're picking up something new. You know why is that? Because they're all those viruses that pass through secretions. And I would say a good third of the new patients I see are little kids that have a little bit of asthma and find themselves in daycare. And they come in to me and say, oh my gosh, you know, doctor, the baby's just sick all the time, never gets better. And well, this is the reason why, they're in daycare. Um, viruses can live in secretions on inanimate objects like clothes, the daycare workers' clothes, toys, countertops, for 8 to 10 to 12 hours. Okay? And to date, they've described over 160 different strains of just the common cold virus, where every child has to get every one of those before they stop getting so many colds. And while it's not such a big problem for a kid of this that is otherwise normal, other than they get lots of runny nose, maybe occasion of infection, kiddos have underlying neurologic problems like DMD, a cold can be pretty much overwhelming to them. So you have to take that into account, you know, what, what we're going to do, because that's going to cause significant problems, okay? Um, well, when they do get sick, I can tell you we have these kiddos, because we know that they don't clear speech very well, they probably get secondary bacterial infections very quickly. My guess is their airways probably are colonized with some more nasty bacteria, just because they, they don't clear secretions very well. That I always had a very low threshold for these kiddos, or kiddos like them, are on antibiotics. You know, some docs say, well, it's just a virus, you can let it run its course. And well, in this type of patient, I'm going to have a much lower threshold for being much more aggressive and putting them on IV antibiotics. And then we'll increase the respiratory therapies. therapies. The CPT, be that, be that percussion foster draining, be that death rest treatment. A lot of times they develop an asthma like condition. The lungs develop an asthma like condition with any repeated insult. So you keep beating up in the lungs, pretty soon it makes the airways twitchy because of all the inflammation that's there. So a lot of these kiddo, kiddos end up on albuterol, which is typically something we use in asthma patients. And again, the easy path. We have a very low threshold for hospitalizing these kids. <clears throat> again, you have a child that has a very ineffective cough who can't clear secretion very well. Again, just from a simple viral infection, even if it's all virus, the secretion may overwhelm them much, much, much quicker than a child who doesn't have these issues. So we'll have a low threshold to put them in the hospital. Let's get, what that allows you to do is give more frequent respiratory treatments. You know, the parents come to us and they're diligently doing whatever form of chest physiotherapy they have at home, and they're doing it three or four times a day. That wears people out. I mean, it takes you 45 minutes probably to do a whole treatment. They'll be all chest physiotherapy, and now we're starting to do that four times a day, and the kid actually probably needs it every four hours. The parents come to us after a day, so they're just exhausted. You know, we say, we need to put the kid in, but we have you know, a crew of respiratory therapists that come around and take care of this for you. Um, also, these kids are going to probably get into trouble um, by dropping their oxygen saturation sooner than other kids again because they can't clear secretions, they block out of their lungs, they get atelectasis, they get frank pneumonia, they'll need supplemental oxygen, and then if they're going to be admitted, a lot of times they're going to put them on IV antibiotics. The issue with IV versus oral antibiotics is that you get much higher levels of antibiotics, and so you can penetrate into those areas that the antibiotics are having trouble getting into. The bottom line is we're just much, much more aggressive in treatment of these kiddos from the rest of the I mean, Low threshold they haven't seen, get them on antibiotics, pumping up their therapies. If it isn't working, low threshold to bring them to the hospital and get aggressive. What about then if you get into more, more you know, chronic problems, and by that I mean chronic hypoventilation. That is because if, you, if you're having troubles with you know, poor tone in the airways, you got scoliosis, your chest cage isn't working right, 
Uh, you cannot effectively get air in and out of your lungs. And if your tone is, is gradually decreasing over time, then you're going to get in with hyperventilation. Because you're not going to blow off your carbon dioxide. You can't get enough air in and out of your lungs on a regular basis. And that then first manifests itself in sleep. Again, I go back to when I said, you know, during sleep, our tone goes down. Um, and if you're starting with a much lower baseline, then you're probably going to get in trouble first in sleep. And your oxygen level is going to be dropping. The carbon dioxide levels are going up. And, and uh, you'll actually be developing respiratory failure. But early signs of respiratory failure are picked up in the sleep lab. <clears throat> and that's why, as the kiddos are getting worse, we may say, okay, we're gonna get a sleep study at least once a year or six months, depending on how they're doing. Um, and so diagnosis, arterial blood gases or some type of blood gas, that's gonna allow you to look at the, acutely the oxygen level, but now we have oximeters, so it's not a big deal. It's, it's more to look at the carbon dioxide level. Um, and the carbon dioxide level is really what's telling you how well the child is ventilating, how well is the air going in and out of the chest. You can look at that indirectly by looking at something called the serum bicarbonate level. Bicarbonate is something if your carbon dioxide level goes up in your bloodstream, your kidneys are smart, they know that's not a good thing. And so then you start to conserve, you hang on to bicarbonate. And so an indirect measure of long-term or longer-term <coughs> high carbon dioxide levels is a gradually increasing uh, bicarbonate level. But probably the gold standard is going to be the overnight polysomnogram. Okay, if we get them in the sleep lab, we measure all these variables, and we can tell you is this, is this child slipping into our, you know, respiratory failure. So what happens when you get to that point with any of these progressive neurologic problems? Well, then, then it gets to be the question of what, how aggressive do you, do you get? And I heard Dr. Moody came in and talked to you already about palliative care and things like that. And, um, but that's a very tough decision, you know. So we've got a kid that's getting frequent pneumonia, it's getting hospitalized a lot because it can't clear secretions. Now they're showing you evidence of chronic hyperventilation, respiratory failure, what do you do? Well, you know, we, we work with the families and try to work out what is the best, best approach, how aggressive do you want us to be at this point? I mean, we're there to, to work with you and to support you and to keep the child as comfortable as possible. Well, that may mean, again, just maybe just the trials of nasal CPAP, BiPAP, especially the BiPAP, because the BiPAP, you're actually helping the children move air in other chest. CPAP is just a continuous pressure. BiPAP, you go from the lower level of CPAP to the higher level of CPAP, you're actually giving a breath. So it's called <clears throat> it's nasal ventilation. So it's like kind of being hooked up to a ventilator but without a trach, without being intubated. And so a lot of kids, that's what we we'll do, because it makes the kids more comfortable. They can sleep better at night, they have more energy during the day. So it's a, it's a fairly long-term temporizing measure. We oftentimes will do that. Um, if, if you get to the point where even that's not working, then you're talking about the only thing you're left with in these kiddos would be a tracheostomy tube, which tube that goes in through the in the neck into the airway, and then you put them on a ventilator. Okay. Um, again, for many parents, they like the children that have severe underlying neurologic issues not to go that way, not to go that. Way. Um, but as physicians, we're here to tell you these are the options, and we're going to work with you, what works best for you and the family and the child. Um, and it, every child, every family situation is different, and so we're going, to, we're going to try and sort that out with you. So that's kind of an overview of the pulmonary issues seen with PMD. Um, happy to answer any questions when I have one more myself. So. Yes? With expiration, with it? Would the child present like a small child present with like a cold? Like would you hear the adventitious sounds like a, the rattling, the bronchitis? Would you hear that? Yeah, so the, so, so the question in the back is how does the child present with, with aspiration? You know, you can have acute aspiration where you're just perfectly fine and the kid has a big gulp of something and boom, you know, gets into respiratory distress right away, it starts working hard to breathe, but typically not how they're going to present. It's going to be more like you said. They'll come in and they just, their chest is junky all the time. Okay, they have that, those, those rattling stuff. A lot of times parents say they just, they can feel the rattling yeah. when they're holding them. Okay, and again, for a lot of these kiddos, especially you know, early on, because they're, they're letting things go down and penetrate into the voice box area, they actually develop a very, they, they become very insensitive to secretions sitting there. Again, you or I, I hear these kids and <clears throat> it makes me want to clear my throat, it makes me want to cough, you know? It's like, geez, but they it just, and it just hangs out there all the time. So they're probably aspirating little bits all the time. And so you're right, it's just more rattling. And if you said a chronic so chest condition. If you have your feeding study, would you 
do a baseline when you see on a chest X-ray or CT that there is some damage? You know, it, actually, that's that's kind of a later uh, finding. Um, I'll get chest X-rays maybe periodically to see is there, are you starting to develop some clear-cut evidence on X-ray that the kiddos are aspirating, but that isn't that can be quite a ways down the road. So you really have to know more clinically what's going on, what the video feeding study shows, and things like that. If you're, if you're starting to see chronic changes on x-ray, which may mean even even the start of that bronchiectasis I talked about, the big dilatation of the airway and stuff, it's really advanced disease by then. If you're gonna intervene, ideally you would intervene way before then. Okay, just when you present with this noisy, junky, you know, breathing and chest congestion. What else, yes? Is it typical when you do an X-ray not to spot pneumonia? We've seen that with my daughter. Yeah, you can certainly again. Could it be more? I don't like using bronchitis in kids, but it could be more inflammation, extra secretions in the larger airways, and so you're not going to see that. You may see what we call increased markings in the lungs, a little bit of swelling of the line of the airways, maybe extra secretions, but you won't see a frank pneumonia. We typically talk pneumonia, you're talking a socked in area where most of the lungs are black, and most of you see is one area that's nothing but white. Okay? And, and so you can certainly have a lot of clinical disease and not see that picture. So. And just the last pneumonia she had, just right after the conference last year, we had an x ray and they were like, well, there's a little something, so we'll give her a little antibiotic. And a few days later, we're, we're worse, and we go back in and we get another x ray. And and by our, when was an ER visit? When was a regular walking? So by the second ER visit, I'm going. We've had two chest X-rays. Something's really wrong. And he did a CAT scan. And he's like, Oh, we have double pneumonia. Yeah, I, you know, I can tell you what, again, no, two things. One is chest x-rays always lag behind the clinical picture. Okay. So you could have significant pulmonary disease and not see it. And two, CT scans are much more uh, uh, dramatic in, in showing you what's going on in the lungs. Well, and that's okay. what I was wondering as far as do I need to be more aggressive when I go in as a parent. Yeah, I can tell you that okay. CT scans have a, the whole risk we run into in, in any type of um, x-rays is the amount of radiation. CT scans have a thousand times the radiation exposure as a chest x-ray. So while the occasional CT is going to be bad, if you're getting very frequent CTs, and this is an issue again in CF, because one of the ways you can monitor CF1 disease is by getting CT scans, because it's so much more demonstrative of what's going on in the lungs. But yeah, we don't want that much radiation. Okay. So but having said that, places like Riley, good children's hospitals have found ways to greatly decrease the amount of radiation that's given. But this isn't on the same like every other cold or in a CT scan of chest to look for little areas of pine. So we probably wouldn't do that. Other questions? No? Well, thanks for having me. It's like they just brought in a bunch of sandwiches or something. So Dr. Crawford's going to have a tough talk. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.